The Holy Spirit sees all of the world the same. The Holy Spirit sees the world as neutral. The Holy Spirit gives a whole new meaning to the world. There's even one part of the Course in Miracles where Jesus says, the Holy Spirit does not see the world the way you do. And if you want to be peaceful, you're going to have to see the way the Holy Spirit sees the world, not the way a personality self with limited vision looks upon the world. You've got to go for more of an expansive vision. Not like vision boarding, you know, you're kind of vision board, get a new surfboard, a new yacht or something. Jesus isn't talking about that kind of vision. He doesn't mention vision boards, <laughs> ever. He's talking about vision of Christ, like seeing with light, letting the veil drop and seeing with the great rays, he calls it, with a pure revelation. It's, it's not, it doesn't mix with these visions. Hmm, I had a vision of the person I'm going to marry. No. Oh, I had a vision of the place I'm going to live. No. It's not any of the tiny little visions, you, you know, you, you don't go to a psychic or or a, a, for a card reader or whatever to get this kind of vision. This is your very life, your very nature, is sight, is seeing. You know, when we say, I see, I see, means I understand. Yeah, but it's talking about spiritual vision. So once you start to see that, then you're ready for the next step, which, which the human being and the, the ego doesn't like. As human beings, we have this saying, Variety is the spice of life. Mm -hmm. You may not like this one. It's gonna. I'm gonna give it to you. <laughs> Variety is not the spice of life. It's part of the death wish. There's no variety in heaven. It's pure, absolute oneness. And you say, well, have you ever actually been there? Well, I've had three revelatory experiences where the three-dimensional world collapsed and then the great rays started streaming through and I went into full-blown revelatory experiences where it was the disappearance of the universe. And it's absolutely magnificent. It's sublime. If you think you've had some thrills in this world, try getting hit with the great rays, like a fire hose of light between the eyes and then all of a sudden it doesn't hurt. It's, ah. Oh. It's that agape, unconditional love. It's, there's no conditions to it. There's no parameters. You know everything. You are everything. That's it. And there, there is absolutely no variety in that. Any teaching that teaches about unique, separate expressions of God, we even have a word for it in uh, philosophy. It's called pantheism. You know, finding God within objects, whether they're totem poles or the ocean or the trees or whatever. It's not it, and, I, and I'm happy to be able to share with you just to save you some time so you don't try to go find God in that tree. It's great to hug a tree. I've done that, and I enjoy that. I'll go around the location, you'll see me hugging palm trees as well as puppy dogs, animals, you know, people. You know, it's, I'm, I'm indiscriminate with that. Uh, I even can do hugs in the water sometimes, you know, just pretend I'm squishing the water. You know, it's, it's all right. To hug, but it's what I'm saying is don't go looking for God in objects. Love knows no object. Why would we think that God knows objects? You know, true love. We're not talking about objective love where you have, <coughs> like the, the Jennifer Aniston movie and Paul Rudd that you like so well, the object of my affection. You know, that's a common phrase. Oh, so and so is the object of my affection. Why should we objectify affection? Why should we objectify love and limit it to one thing. I was looking at a car today and it's, it's, it was peace and I thought, oh, there's peace. And then I looked and it was like, it was justice. And you have to really go deep into the topic of justice to see that there is no justice in this world. If you're looking for justice in this world, you come to the wrong planet, the wrong cosmos. Uh, you're never going to find it. Then you see social justice. There's a contradiction in terms. If you think you're ever going to find justice in the social, give it up. Now, of course, I give these talks and I have people, there are social workers that come to me and this and this, but see, I've already been there and done that. I've, I, I can have great compassion 
for that because I was a case manager. I, I worked in the social services. I, I've walked through that. I would never ask anybody to let go of anything that I haven't already looked at myself and been inside of and found the futility, absolute futility of it. Because there's a section in the course called the justice of heaven, which is when you forgive, when you come back to the kingdom of heaven, that's where you find fairness. Heaven is fair. Inequality is not fair, but inequality is not real. So why would you keep looking outside yourself and perpetuating inequality? Why would you keep, think, keep thinking that there's some that are better, some are worse off, some that are advantaged, some that are disadvantaged, some that are superior, some that are inferior? Do you really think a God of benevolence and a God of unconditional love would, would invent concepts like superior and inferior? You're not going to find any fairness in the world and you, neither will you find justice there. And the more you realize this, the more you will not waste your energy and your effort, your mind energy, trying to look for that. You know, when, we, when you're a little kid and mom comes and she cuts up the pie, of course, You've come here believing in the ego. Of course your eyes are darting down and looking as she's slicing the pie and not paying too close attention to what she's doing. And you're going, good, good, she's not watching. And then when she gets the scooper out and you know, you're waiting, you're hoping that you're gonna get a big, the biggest piece. <laughs> and then when you don't and your siblings do, then that, that's when it starts. He got a bigger piece, she got. You know, it's not fair. It's not fair. I don't like you. Don't like me. You gave them a bigger piece. You know, it's that's that's the chatter of the world. You know, I didn't. It's not fair. And think about that in relationship. If if you took want out of the vocabulary, but imagine in in your relationships where you took all comparison out of all communications, uh, so there would never be. Well, we'll do it your way, but my way is next time. Or, you know, if you never could, were allowed to break it up, compromise, compare, contrast, if, you, if that was all taken from you, you know, <laughs> you just have to surrender, maybe and have a kiss or something, because you you really wouldn't have very much you could do. You know, talk about being locked in there, it would, it would seem like a very unhuman relationship. But actually, after a while, after you got over the initial shock, your mind would go, ah, this is so good. Wow. Talking about what you call it, uh, eye gazing, what did you call it? Eye? Mind sex. Mind sex. She wanted to practice with her husband mind sex. And all they do is they sit, she, she was saying, just sit across from each other and gaze into each other's eyes and she was saying, oh, it's wonderful. She said, I think this is great. I, she didn't care what, what came after that. It's like the <laughs> best 10 minutes of the day, you know, because it was a, a sense of joining and connecting and stillness and eye gazing. And instead of getting right into actions and taking actions and so forth, it was more of a sinking experiencing and really quite mystical. You know, and, and so that's, that's very much like an open-eyed, like a Zen open-eyed eye-gazing exercise. But, but that's important in the sense that, that we really start to see that, that variety is not the spice of life. And that actually sameness is, is where the real pizzazz comes in. You think variety gives you spice, I'll tell you a bit about sameness. You've never seen anything so passionate so fired up. It's like, the, it's like the fire of the spirit, you know, when you get into sameness. There's even a part in the Course where he says, make this year different by making it all the same. He's actually encouraging us to have a whole year of absolute sameness with no variety at all. That's what he's encouraging. And I know to the ego, the ego would just go, oh, that's just like a total deflation. And yet, if you get into your function as miracle workers and, and as miracle working, you will find that, that we use the word surreal. There's a surrealness coming in when you travel to enough places and you do it enough years with this goal to be shown a new way of looking. 
you actually start to feel your mind kind of coming to some kind of an equilibrium where there's an inner joy, there's an inner glee, and an inner happiness, and your eyes may still seem to look about and still report differences, but Jesus says, but the healed mind has put them into one category, they are unreal. The body's eyes will continue to report differences, but the equilibrium in your mind of not judging and not interpreting them as real differences gives you the peace of mind. I was on the plane in China, in communist China, and they said the, pl the, the flight has been diverted. People around me, well, what did he say? What did he say? I said, it's all the same. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I've even told people in South America, what, they said, what happens if you were in a nosedive and your plane was going straight down into the ocean? I said, well, you could just watch me. Just watch me in the seat. It's gonna, I'm going to be in joy in every last moment. <laughs> Maybe not having a drink at that moment because of the trajectory, but, but you know, when you get this feeling inside that your, your mind, your soul is in equilibrium and you're in stillness, the form doesn't matter. We're going to see that movie, uh, The Impossible, which is about the tsunami in Thailand. You know, I, I really enjoyed that movie, even though I would say from the world standards it is extremely graphic. But I was really enjoying it. In fact, Frances was looking at me. She was watching my face during the movie. If he can watch that movie like this, you know, I want to watch my that movie. Because, because I wasn't interpreting the scenes from the ego filter. It wasn't, there was no denial. I just was in a, I was in my tabula rasa, you know, blankness of just stillness and, and really just observing. And the body's eyes were still, I didn't close my eyes at all. Frances, she was, her face was down in my lap, but, but no, I didn't ever close my eyes in that movie because I was able to just watch it because I had no interpretations of it. And, and that's why I can tell you honestly that variety is not the spice of life, that, that if you hold this single purpose of forgiveness, it will unify your perception and you will see everything alike. No more like and dislike, no more attraction, no more repulsion, no more beautiful and ugly. I was with a group of students back in the mid-1990s and we went out and it was in Denver, Colorado at a spiritual community and we walked out over this bridge and it was one of these kind of Courier and Ives winter scenes. And we were really deep into the course, you know, really, really deep into mind training the course. And one of the students, she went, it's beautiful. And then she went, she got this look of guilt on her face and she looked over at me. And I came over to her and I put my arm around her and I said, you know, it is beautiful, but it's beautiful from, from what's inside. If your mind is in a state of serenity, of single-mindedness, of single purpose, then everything is beautiful. When your mind's beautiful, when your mind's still, everything's beautiful but it's not beautiful in the contrast of something that's ugly. You can't find meaning, you can't glorify some things and call them beautiful and juxtapose them with other things that are ugly. That's just not how the spirit sees. That's just not how it works. And, and when you do that, you've fallen into the ego's trap and you'll just try to maximize the beauty and minimize the ugly. You'll try to run towards certain things and run away from other things. And, and really there's no satisfaction in that. And, and the other thing I want to say is that sameness is not boring. Do I feel bored? No, I don't feel bored. I feel alive. I feel joy. It's a bubbling joy. It's glee. I like that word glee, glee. Glee is not boring. But, but glee sees sameness. Glee is non-judgment and non-judgment doesn't look upon things and offer a judgment and then try to say this is better or this is worse and content itself with that kind of judgment. It's actually not judging, it's prior to judgment is where this glee is. You can't find it out there in the world. I mean, sometimes children can seem very gleeful and you can see them running around and they're so gleeful and everything until they smack into something <laughs> And they go, ah, and it turns <laughs> from glee into <laughs> tears, trauma. That's not the glee I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about the glee of desirelessness, the glee of, of a peaceful mind. <laughs>